Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Nikki Jovakic from Lookup Strata and I'm very happy to welcome Will Marquand, General Manager of Tower Body Corporate. During the session, we'll be discussing everything Queensland Strata. Please note that the information discussed today refers solely to Queensland legislation. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that the information contained in this session, including the discussions that arise from submitted questions, is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as legal advice. You should seek independent advice before acting on the information contained in this session. I'm delighted to introduce our panellists today, Will Marquand from Tower Body Corporate. Will is a licensed strata and community manager. Late last year, Will moved to Queensland to join the Tower Body Corporate team as general manager, senior body corporate manager, after five years working in the strata industry in New South Wales. Will has experience working across residential, commercial and industrial schemes. A former journalist and teacher, Will is using his communication skills to help Tower grow their expanding business. Will is a regular contributor to the Lookup Strata site, providing answers to Queensland Strata questions on at least a weekly basis. Will appears on around 40 of our Queensland blog posts. Many of these Q&A articles contain multiple responses by Will, and just one of the Q&As about admin and sinking funds has received over 3,700 page views in the last 30 days. We'd like to say thanks for the support and for taking the time out of your busy week to join us here today. Welcome to today's webinar, Will. Uh, thanks, Nikki. Wonderful to be here. And hello to everyone who's listening out there. Um, it's terrific to hear that, uh, you know, when we put out information about, you know, in this case, it was the Admin and Sinking Fund, so many people are taking the opportunity to respond uh, and read that. Um, it's, you know, it's really encouraging as a writer because sometimes you feel that your the work that you put out there goes into a void. But I hope that it's really valuable to people uh, who are reading that tip and taking on that information um, because really Strata is about informing yourself. And uh, I believe in great communication where possible. And um, it's, good to, it's good to know that we're having some impact with that. And obviously your journalist skills come into play, Will, and you make it quite easy to read the, the responses and um, get the information across to which we thank you for. Yeah, thanks. I mean, uh, Body Corporate's one of those jobs where um, most people come from one different industry or another before they, before they start doing this job. In my case, I've always been involved in communications and uh, hopefully I've been able to put some of those skills to use uh, as a body corporate manager, at least in um, being able to explain things, some of the circumstances that arise in their day to day body corporate life. And some of those uh, page read uh, stats are just, uh, uh, yeah, they're huge, aren't they? We're always surprised when I look back through. And uh, if we took the addition of all of the articles that, that you've contributed to um, into play, they'd be uh, quite staggering numbers. So it's great to see that people are getting value out of that. It's good. I, I, uh, it's, it's probably modest to say, but I'm thrilled to hear that there's so many people <laughs> who are paying attention. So thanks very much for the opportunity. <laughs> Uh, okay, that's great. And we're just, um, before we begin going through the submitted questions, uh, we just wanted to mention that recently Tower Body Corporate conducted a South East Queensland survey on strata living. Um, we've published some of the information at a limited um, stage at this stage, but um, just detailing the results of the survey, but really keen to get into some of the more responses that we had. And can you tell us, Will, about the survey and maybe we can discuss a few of the questions in a bit of detail as well? Sure, so uh, we put out a survey to all of our contacts and we received 191 uh, responses, which I think is pretty healthy, uh, a healthy group of responses there for us. Um, for anyone who's interested, you can go to the Tower webpage and then click on the blog section and you can find the uh, full results of the survey as well as some analysis of, of the initial results. What I've found in Body Corporate is there actually isn't much information about how Body Corporate owners really think. Um, there, there are sort of larger national surveys that are taking place more and more frequently that give us an idea of you know, who lives in Body Corporates and things like this. So we, know, we now have pretty good statistics around the demographics of, of the age groups and, the, uh, and the statistics like that. But there's still relatively limited information to understand well, just, just that very question, what, what do people, what are, you, what are you thinking? How are you feeling about the body corporate? Um, this was a very small step towards achieving that, uh, but I was, I was happy to get the results back. I suppose there was nothing um, overly dramatic from my perspective was, 
of working as a body corporate manager for five years because then the results reflected all of the emails and phone calls that I've had down, down the years. But there's still kind of some interesting uh, findings and I can go through a few of those with you. Uh, the first one, one, one of the initial questions we asked is why, why did people choose to buy into a body corporate? And overwhelmingly the responses were uh, in relation to the convenience that those type of buildings can offer. So um, seven, over 70% of people responded that they, they chose to purchase in a body corporate because of the location. Um, and that makes sense because you know people who live in busy lives, they like to live closer to transport hubs, closer to their offices or closer to you know um, the beach, maybe it might be, which is often the case here, here in Queensland. And uh, these buildings offer that opportunity. Um, otherwise, um, you know, people we had sort of 35 percent of people responding that they moved in because there's less individual responsibility. And living in a body corporate is a great chance for people to you know, sit back a little bit and let let, some, let let other people take a little bit more control over the running of the building and the organisation, uh, as opposed to say running their own house where you have to be uh, you know, it's a day to day day to day uh, organisational skills organisational skills are required. Um, and the other the other factor that stood out was people. Uh, you know, they, they, they said they were moved, moved in because it was a comfortable lifestyle. Five percent of people responded, responded to that instance. So really what I'm taking from these initial results is what people like from uh, body corporate is they like the idea that they can be driven. And they, they like the idea that they can, um, you know, live a comfortable life, live a comfortable lifestyle within their, within that environment. And that's really what they want to take out of it. So that's the first kind of point that I wanted to mention. Um, what what I saw on the other side on, on the other side of that was uh, that so, some some reluctance on the part of owners to sort of accept that having convenience also comes at a cost. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we all know the old business victims when they, anyone asks how how do you want it, you, know, you can have it fast, you can have it uh, cheap, or you can have it good quality for getting it for two. Um, that's that's a standard response to any any time anyone asks about business. And what what you've got here is people are asking for convenience. But when I've seen about uh, whether people are really willing to pay for that, the answer is probably not so much. So, for example, we had a question around uh, whether you people would be prepared to pay higher levies to improve their body corporate complex. You know, twenty five percent of people strongly disagreed. Another twenty five percent of people disagreed. So that's half of the people there who are saying. Yes, I like the convenience. I like. I like to. I want. You know. I want to have that for my life. But I'm not really prepared to put in um, the. You know. The make the financial investment necessarily to make that possible. And I think that's where you might see a lot of uh, disharmony that starts in body corporate begin, which is where people have slightly different expectations between what they want out of a body corporate and what they're prepared to put into it. So I, I, I found those two factors fairly interesting myself. And we do have lots of questions that come into the lookup strata site as well. We'll um, involving um, payments of levies, of course, and um, if special levies are, are raised for some some reason, if something needs to be done. But we will also just to let everybody know. You mentioned about the um, results of the survey, and we will place a link where, when we send the email out later today with the recording. We'll place a link in there to that um, post on the tower site as well, and people can go and have a look and and download the results if they'd like to to have a bit more detail as well. Yeah, um, you know, but obviously, you know, it's interesting. People are under pressure, so we asked the question about what's the major concern of your body corporate. And rising costs was the number one. It's, you know, it's, it's uh, 50, almost fifty percent of people responded to that as being a top issue. As body corporate managers, I mean, it's we're very conscious of it because it's something that's it's part of our everyday job. Everyone's very costs. You know, cost pressures are increasing substantially. We're seeing the cost of contractors go up. We're seeing the cost of building maintenance go up. Uh, there's increasing levels of compliance that are required all the time. Um, so people are feeling a lot of pressure about how to run these buildings, and that is quite substantial. And do you feel there's a general understanding uh, from lot owners in particular about where their, their levy payments are going to and what, what they're actually paying for? Um, across most lot, lot owners, yes, I think that's the answer. I think most people can, they get their financial statements and they can understand 
um, as they read through the budget items, they can see that there's a certain amount of proportion to cleaning and a certain amount of proportion to gardening and so on and so forth. Um, but you, you often get problems where, you know, some people, you know, so some people don't read those statements and they, and they, 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 mis they misunderstand what, what's happening or that they think that they pay the levy and so that that provides an in infinite pot of money that, that can be drawn upon. Um, but that, that just doesn't, you know, you know, it doesn't work that way. But uh, yeah, so I think there, there is some, there is some level of misunderstanding to that extent, which is once I've paid my levy, that's it. No, it doesn't really work that way. It's your, le your levy pays for certain things, usually because you're included within the budget, but there may be more money required and that people don't always realize that that's the case. Okay, all right, that's great, thank you. And do you have any more um, uh, any more questions you'd like to, to mention that, that came from the survey at all or any other points of interest we can talk about? Um, sure, so a couple of different points. Uh, one, one, one that I'm always very interested in, I ask whether uh, committee members should be paid for the work that they do. Um, here, you know, the answer was overwhelmingly no. Uh, we had almost 50% of people just saying no, and uh, another 20% of people beyond that saying definitely no. So almost 70% of people uh, saying that they don't really think that committee members should be paid. And that, that's understandable in the context of costs when, we, when we're talking about people not wanting to increase any costs within their buildings. Um, so the reason why I ask this question is because I often feel that the work committee members do is unvalued to a great deal. Uh, I deal with a lot of people on a daily basis who do hundreds of emails through the year, make you know, dozens and dozens of phone calls, meet contractors, uh, spend a lot of time talking to owners and uh, probably corporate managers like myself. And a lot of that work is hidden and underappreciated. And I'm when I go to meetings, I always try to make a point of uh, you know thanking the committee and uh, acknowledging what the work they've done and trying to raise that up. But it's that that's only a small that's only a small acknowledgement for all of the great work that gets done. And I think that it's very important that the wider group of owners need to have a better understanding of all of the effort that the committee makes to try to bring the building to a point of satisfaction. Because there's a lot of complaints when something doesn't work out. But very few thank very few thank yous when when things are going well and to me that's that's quite important because um as a professional body corporate manager my job is to assist people but it's really the communities that do do the hard and the most valuable work within within this whole you know eco eco structure and uh, i i think they should be better supported in many ways um getting paid is just uh you know, it's not necessary. It's not necessary in terms of how that support should come, but it's a, it's an acknowledgement of, of that it's because people often only value financial payments rather than anything else. But I thought that was quite interesting that there was a lot of resistance to it uh, myself. Uh, the other kind of things, um, you know, pet bylaws have been a hot topic item within the news over the last year or so. Uh, generally, you know, we've found in favour of, in favor of uh, pet owners uh, in different states around the country. But with the owners that we asked, 50% uh, said that uh, it should be the decision of the owners and each body corporate as to whether pets should be allowed uh, within each building. Um, so that's not consistent with the way the, the court findings have been, have been going over the past few years. But it is interesting that people still feel that they have the right to self determination. Um, yeah, I thought that was quite an interesting mm. point. I, yeah, I'm sure that uh, the pet owners out there may not may not feel that way. <laughs> but perhaps people feel that they, you know, if they fall into a building, and the structure of body corporate law is around self determination of owners. People feel the right strongly to protect that kind of individual right of determination for each building. Well, I thought that one was quite good. And then the only other real one I had to mention was uh, on Airbnb residencies. Um, fairly straightforward question. Should, should short-term tenancies be allowed in body corporate properties? Uh, overwhelmingly, no. 50, over 50% saying no. And I think this is just, for me, it's pretty easy. People don't want to live in hotels. Mm. These, the, you know, these, these buildings are people's homes and they don't want to be living next to someone who's just in for a couple of days and who doesn't know the system and how things work or where to put the rubbish away and all those, those kind of stuff. 
So again, I think that's against where you see the legislation going, which has tended to be more permissive towards allowing equity fees. And I understand the argument that owners who have an investment should be allowed to make a good return on that investment. Uh, but it's also people's lives that we're talking about here. It's your everyday life, how you live your life. And like I say, you bought into a building where you're expecting people, re residents, and then you find yourself constantly being next to um, you know, occupants on a short-term basis. That can be very frustrating for some people. So over over 50% saying no. Yeah. Mm. Pretty interesting, isn't it? And it brings up quite a few issues, doesn't it? I mean, you've got security issues with people coming in and out of the building. You've got wear and tear on the building with constant changeover of people moving bits, bits and pieces in and out and, and using probably using uh, facilities more than they would if they live there on a short-term basis. And um, so there's, there's all of that con to consider as well. Yeah, I think so. So, the you know, the individual owner who's leasing, they're, they're receiving income from the Airbnb, which is great for them. No problems with that. But... The real costs of hosting that Airbnb are probably being spread out more across the wider group of owners, and that, and that's not you know they're, they're, that's not being reflected in terms of the income of the building. So I can see quite a few problems. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, if you're happy to move away from that now, unless you've got anything else you'd like to mention about the the survey at all, will? No. Well, if anyone's out there who took the survey, I'd just like to say take the opportunity to say thanks for it, say thanks very much. And then, you know, not just from our company, but any, any owners in general, when you do get the opportunity to participate for these kinds of surveys, it's really great if you can add your input because in, information is short on the ground. We really don't have enough knowledge about how people are feeling and how people, how, you know, how, how people think about body corporates at the moment. So when you do have the chance to participate, uh, it does feed back into, into some added knowledge from not, you know, not just our company, but it's for the industry. That's helpful. Thank you. Mm. And on that point, I might just put um, put a, a request out there. We're always from Look Up Strata. We're always interested in in uh, the views of our readers as well. And we get obviously lots of questions coming in on a regular basis, but we don't get a lot of um, a lot of information coming in about the way things are, are happening well in buildings and what you're doing that works really well. So anyone that has any of those um, types of comments, please feel free to send them in to us. We're happy to share them with our audience. We did have I noticed we've had a question coming about washing down of balconies and we did have a uh, one of our lot owners down in Victoria sent us in some information to say that they have a great system in place where they actually um, set a day aside and let everybody know uh, there's a particular Saturday will be balcony washing Saturday and they'll work from the top of the building all the way down the building and they're given a certain amount of time and a time slot to wash down their balconies and that works really well in their building so that was a really great um, really great piece of information that we pushed out through our state magazines as well because it was applicable across Australia really so if you've got any points or tips like that we'd really love to hear about it and we'll certainly share them with our audience. Yeah, I think that's good. Uh, more more positive news in body corporate would be great because it is out there. It is happening. It's just that we are, we we tend to talk about and focus on the negative stuff so much. It's very easy to forget. But uh, I think it does work well as a system for the majority of people. Um, but it's when problems start that they 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 become outsized and we we inevitably we focus on it so much. But yeah, more positive news, please. That's possible. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we feel the same way. They contact everyone contacts us, which we're happy to help um, when you've got an issue. But please let us also know about those positive things so we can yeah push that. We always try and put a positive spin on everything that we that we push out. To, to let people know how we can solve problems and help. So that would be great as well. All right, we might step into some of those questions now, Will. Uh, if you're ready to do that, the first one. Okay, uh, parking. We've got a few questions about parking. Parking comes up all of the time. Once again, we're delving into some problems in that area, uh, but parking in visitor parking and on common property in this instance. Uh, we live in a 75 townhouse unit complex with multi-car families and work vehicles. We have received a breach notice in relation to parking our car in visitor parking and on common property roadways. There are no car parks in our complex for owners other than designated garages. Our garage is quite small and our car will not fit. Our driveway outside our garage is very short and only fits a very small compact car like a mini, not our car. The complex is in a small cul-de-sac which caters for around four cars to park on the road, but these parks are usually already taken by the time we arrive home from work. What are our options? Can we request special approval from the Body Corporate Committee to use a visitor park? 
if, if there is nowhere to legally park our car, then we either have to sell our car and purchase a small mini car or sell the townhouse and move. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I, I, I've hardly ever managed the, the scheme that hasn't had parking issues to some degree or another. There, there must be more cars than there are parking spots, uh, I, I would guess. <laughs> um, so, you know, parking is a constant thorn in a lot of people's sides. But it's also the case that the body corporate can't just increase the number of car parking spaces or can't make car parking spaces bigger or garages bigger or anything like this. So there's very limited capacity for a body corporate to take action. Uh, in this case, the owner is asking, is, is saying that they, uh, their unit doesn't really have a large enough space for the size of vehicle that they want. Um, and as a result, they, you know, they're looking at maybe they would have to buy a smaller vehicle or move house. I mean, the answer to that is kind of yes. Um, unfortunately, you know, we, we all we all have to make compromised decisions in our life about how we live, and it might be the case that you have to buy a smaller vehicle, or if, if the property really doesn't suit your lifestyle, you might have to, you know, look at look at changing changing that. Um, there's a they ask, can we request special approval from the body corporate committee to use the business car park? Uh, you can certainly request it, but I couldn't really imagine many circumstances in which the answer would be yes, because you've got 75 townhouses here. Presumably everyone would like to have an extra car parking space or a bigger car parking space. And the body corporate's not able to not able to provide that kind of service for everyone. Um, so it's very difficult to see how the answer, you know, how, how that type of request could be accommodated. Uh, behind that kind of request, I guess what the person is asking is, can I have more utility than some of the other users at the site? It, that's really what they're asking. Can I have something more than what I've actually paid for? Um, and and in, a, in that type of situation, the answer is almost always no, I'm afraid. You have, to, you have to accept what it is that you've bought into and what its limitations are um, without, and you have to accept that other people just can't change those very easily for you. So that sounds like a bit of a tough answer, I suppose, but it's it's it's, it's, it's about being realistic in terms of what's possible. Okay, and it, it really comes down to majority rule, doesn't it? Um, yeah, it's majority rule. So I mean, you know, technically it might be possible for the committee to, or the committee or the owners corporation to give, uh, give that one person the extra space, but I can't imagine that there would be a lot of happiness coming out of it because if I lived in that building, uh, I, I might be saying, "Oh, well, I'd like an extra space too, please." And then, then my neighbour would say the, say the same thing. So, uh, you know, where where are you going to get to with that with that kind of conversation? I, I don't think I don't I don't think um, the committee or or the wider body corporate can really entertain uh, an application like that unless there's very exceptional circumstances. I mean, what I might say is I've been involved in in buildings where uh, I have seen like short short term accommodation given to people who use the business parking space. Uh, just just for a personal example, you know, we had someone who had an operation, had difficulty walking, and then there was various reasons why they were given access to the, one of the business spots for, for about three months or so. Um, okay, this is an exceptional circumstance, and in a good amount of time, there's compassionate grounds for providing that kind of exception but unless you've got some kind of real concrete reason like that i can't see a reason why you would give an individual what why would you give one one rather the greater utility than the other okay excellent thank you we've got one about committee member roles here now uh, how can you encourage committee members to firstly understand the laws to think for themselves rather than being influenced by others Sure, what a question. I mean, how, 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 um, how, how can I encourage people to think for themselves rather than be influenced by others? Maybe if I knew the full answer to this question, uh, I might not be sitting here. I might have solved many of, many of life's greater issues, perhaps. Um, I, I, I kind of know what this person's getting at. I, I think behind the question, they're saying perhaps one or two individuals on the committee might have an oversized influence. And, and what, they're, what they're hoping for is that everyone um, takes on takes on the responsibility of making individual choices it's very tough though isn't it because you know committee members they tend to be lay people they're not they're not specialized within the industry so some, some people i might have 
might be lawyers or builders or other things like that. But they very rarely have the, the wide knowledge of the whole industry. And um, when someone presents themselves as being very competent and knowledgeable about an issue, there is a kind of natural human instinct to, to, to fall in with that and agree with that because we don't like to take a, an, an, opposite, an opposite position to, to, to those people. So it does seem to be the case that people who are, who can express themselves very confidently, who can, you know, um, I wouldn't say force themselves out of there, but you know, who, who are very, who are very definite in their position, can have an outside influence on committees. All, all you can say is uh, every person only has one vote, and it and it and it's incumbent on each committee member to to exercise their vote and make the best. So, yeah, you know, I mean, I hope that answers that question to, to some extent. Like like I say, you know, you're much more getting into the realms here of human relationship dynamics. Uh, that's quite. It's quite difficult to answer this. Yeah, it is quite a big question. <laughs> oh, okay, we've got one, another one about committee members, but to do with decision making. So can you, can you ask committee members to elaborate why they are voting for option one instead of option two when the cost is higher for the same scope of work? So I guess it's just a bit more transparency into the decisions yeah. that the committee is making. You can certainly ask people. Um, I always think a reasonable question should should be afforded a reasonable answer um, and provided the answer in response is, is logical and, and consistent, then I think that's fine. People are allowed to make their decisions. You know, it, it, this, it, this is interesting because the previous question is asking about people thinking for themselves. And here it seems that people have thought for themselves. They've thought about the two options and they've selected, they've selected one that they liked. Um, in terms of quotes, you know, if you've got two very close options and you might get slightly different prices, people still can choose the more expensive one, uh, or, and that and that's okay. The, the cheapest quote, the cheapest price, isn't necessarily always the best one that's available to us. Um, I think if you have, for example, if you're dealing with a contractor, maybe it's a contractor you're familiar with that's done good work at your building before. That might be a good reason why you might choose their quote if it's a little bit more expensive that's fine because you you have the confidence that they're going to come on time do the work properly respond to any problems that you might have as opposed to say a contractor who is a bit cheaper but you've never dealt with before so usually i think if there's a logical and reasonable response then it's no problem and is there a case for, for minuting the decision-making process at all? So that um, at some point down the future, you can look back as to why these decisions were made? Um, that's, that's, that's quite an interesting question. I, I, I'm sure there'll be lots of people who give different opinions to that kind of view. My, my view is it's, it's the decision that matters and not so, much the, not so much the opinions that build up to it that's really important. Uh, because in the end, we all need to vote for different decisions, but what, what gets counted is the vote. And it's how, it's how you vote that really matters. It may, be, it, it, it may be important in some schemes and in some circumstances to record some, some rationale. If that, if that was helpful to owners to help them understand why a certain decision had been made, then I don't see a problem with that. But it, I wouldn't see it as an absolute requirement myself. Okay, this is this is quite a big question again. This one that we're just about to go into, oh, but something that we do, <laughs> yeah, something that we do see a lot of. We have um, quite a few questions come in about disruptive lot owners in committee meetings and um, lot owners behaving badly and how to control that behaviour. Mm -hmm. So I'll just um, read this instance out. So one of our owners is the owner from Hell, and our committee is at a loss to know what to do about his behaviour. We recently had a committee meeting where the particular owner behaved badly. We were hoping to be able to require him to attend committee meetings in future only via Zoom. However, we were told we could not implement this strategy unless everyone called in via Zoom. We have some elderly owners in our complex, so this can never be achieved for their sake. He is disruptive, talks to every single issue that's discussed and generally hogs the meeting time. We're aware that other owners have to have permission to speak for a for a committee meeting, but if they abuse that permission and still display other inappropriate behaviour, such as invading others' space, what recourse is open to the committee? 
Can owners be subject to some type of code of contact, conduct for meetings? Should there be something in the bylaws that addresses bad behaviour which can be enforced? It appears that the legislation is nearly impotent in so many ways in this area. Our bylaws are also silent on the issue. We have owners who will now not attend a general meeting if this particular owner is in attendance and we don't really know what we can do about it. Help. Yeah, tough situation. Um, lots of buildings deal with these uh, you know, very difficult individuals. Um, I think as a manager, and especially when I talk to the other the wider group of managers, one of the things we all comment on is the sort of an increasing amount of vitriol amongst owners that gets seen. I, I've only been in the industry for sort of six years. So, but even within that short, sort of short period of time, I feel like the level of tension that some people are bringing, some people are bringing to uh, body courts is, is increasing a lot. And that's causing more and more problems for people who want to deal with situations rationally and just have sensible discussions. Um, in this kind of situation, there are things that they can do. It seems like the owner isn't a committee member. So when they're attending a committee, a committee meeting, they're not really actually entitled to discuss any issue or anything like that. I would say it's always good to have owners at meetings and they really should be encouraged to attend. It is incumbent on the chairperson to control the meeting. The chairperson has a right to demand that the meeting takes place, well, the, the meeting allows reasonable discourse, essentially. And if some, one individual is not allowing reasonable discourse, they are, you know, interrupting other people when they're speaking, if they're too insistent that their point gets made, if they need their, if they need their point to, point to last for 10, 20 minutes or something like that, when others, others don't have that time or uh, willingness to listen to that, then the chairperson has the capacity to draw a line under that person's behaviour they can. Or not given the opportunity to speak, but it, you know you, that, that that sometimes seems a little bit tough. You know, I still think people should still be allowed to have the opportunity to be heard. But you could put a time limit on the on the on the length of response that someone can have. A minute, two minutes, that's usually sufficient to make uh, most most points heard. Um, you know, and if the person can't keep to the basic rule, if they talk over to other people, they rude to other people, if they, you know, if they're using abusive language or shouting or something like that. They should be given a warning that their behavior is inappropriate. And then if they continue to do it, they should be asked to leave the meeting, I think. And if they don't leave the meeting, then the meeting can close. And you can say, well, sorry, we're not able, we're not able to have a reasonable meeting because we need to be in attendance in that situation. So it's important. And, and what you'll get in that situation is the person becomes very isolated from the group quite quickly because others within the group will want to be having a proper discussion. It might, it might not be, it might be a discussion in which they have agreement, disagreement, but it still, it still has to be a rational discussion. Um, and if one person is preventing that, 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 that behavior needs to be isolated and marked out and then ultimately stopped. And I would encourage the chair people out there to undertake that kind of uh, action. And if you're a chairperson and you're not too sure how to do it, Work with your body corporate manager. You know, discuss with them a strategy in advance of the meeting. If you if you if you know in advance of the meeting that you know someone is coming and it's likely to be a problem, work out a strategy in advance. Set your limits in advance. At the beginning of the meeting, you can set limits for what is and isn't acceptable behaviour. And if the person fails to uh, meet those standards, then by all means, ask them ask them to leave the meeting. You know, it's, owners are entitled to reasonable, rational discussion. So one, one person doesn't have the right to dominate uh, the body corporate. Okay, and just the question in there about a code of conduct as well, Will, is there something that's available that's been put out by the, by the um, BCC office or is there uh, something that you can address in the bylaws to control that? I mean, there is a committee code of conduct, uh, but whether how that, that sort of sets out the terms under which the committee should behave. I don't, I'm not really aware that there's a code of conduct per se for owners, owners' behavior. Can the bylaws address it? I mean, it depends what type of behavior we're, we're talking about here. I guess in, in, in this question, it's more relating to behavior within, within a meeting. Um, so I don't know if that's really a, a bylaws issue per se. If it, if it's because what can you do? Send that a breach notice after the meeting when the meeting's already happened. If the meeting's already happened, it's already been disturbed. Um, and even if you do put these type of bylaws 
if you had some kind of bylaw in place, the person wouldn't necessarily be respected in a live situation. So I'm not really sure that's the way to deal with it. Um, if it's meeting control, like I say, I, I think it's about the chairman uh, saying at the beginning of the meeting, these, these are the rules for the conduct of the meeting, being very clear about what those rules are, and then maintaining those rules uh, during the meeting itself. It's hard though, because you have to deal with an individual who might be, you know, aggressive, um, not always, they're not always pleasant. And, and they're very insistent in getting their own views and ways across. Um, but like I say, it's very important to remember that is one person out of the wider group. And they're entitled to, you know, if it's one person out of 10, they're entitled to their, you know, one tenth opinion. But they only, it's only one tenth. And, then, and it's important that the other nine tenths of the people get, get to have their opinion represented. Okay, removal of an office of a committee member. Uh, so in this one here, uh, we have a committee member who's been convicted 14 years ago of an offence. Uh, the committee member has been on the committee for seven years. He's never disclosed his previous history. In Queensland, isn't it a, is it an, an offence to ask a person about their criminal history? We're concerned about the matter now because the offence was fraud related and the person's now seeking election to the treasurer's role how or what procedures would we use to have the committee members position declared vacant? Hmm. Okay, so sl slightly difficult question to answer because I, I think this is about a very specific circumstance in it, in it, in it, in the gem generalised question. Um, in this case, you're looking at one individual's history. I would advise the plan to discuss amongst themselves and then, you know, they may need to seek legal advice on that basis, but I don't think it's something that I, I can really answer in this circumstance to a greater to a greater degree. I mean, there is a question about can committee members be removed from office? And the answer is yes, they can be. Uh, they they can go out the way that they came in by a by a general meeting, and at any stage you can you can put up a you can have a you can have a, a meeting to you know. De deselect committee members, I suppose, if that's, if that's the right, that's the right term, I'm not entirely sure. Um, and, and, and that's a legitimate process, um, but I don't know, I, I couldn't really comment on, you know, if someone's criminal history or something like that, that would be the individual plan to make its determination on. Okay, we might leave that one there. Uh, to do with Form 8, we have a situation in our complex where a property was sold back in March. It's now tenanted, yet the developer of the complex is still down as the owner of the body of the property on the body corporate role. Is there a legal time limit in Queensland for a Form 8 to be issued? And is there anything we can do to speed this along? Um, we had a look at this one. We couldn't find any legal requirements for a Form 8 to be issued. Uh, I mean, Ideally, it should be done straight away as soon as the sale of the property is concluded. The sale is, you know, the property is transferred from one lot owner to another lot owner, and it's important that the body corporate is updated as soon as it can be. Uh, otherwise, well, the new lot owner is not going to be receiving any information because no one knows who they are. For starters, they're not going to get their levies, they're not going to get their ADM notice. They're, they're going to be denied their rights. So it's, it's that it's within that person's interest to try to ensure that the body corporate is updated. But is there any kind of formal requirement to do it? Uh, not, not that we could find, unfortunately. It's a good question because I think in body corporate countries, you know, offices up and down the country, uh, managers have to, and have to spend quite a bit of time chasing up owners who they don't, people who don't know who they are, trying, you know, we contact solicitors and we contact other people to say, well, do we know who's the new lot owner here? Um, it's, it's a time consuming part of the job that we do. Uh, the risk for usually, well, usually you find, usually it, people find out because the old owner remains on the roll until they're replaced and they're getting, they continue to get the levy notices coming through. And that's usually tends to be the trigger point at which, <laughs> which, um, at which the, trip, the change can happen. Um, but what, what you'll find is in some owners' cases, if they don't take the time to update, then that lot is building up a debt over time. And if, if it goes on long enough, then it might be transferred to the debt collector. And the first time they hear about it is when large amounts of debt collection fees have been, uh, you know, have been racked up and they're getting a phone call from someone saying, when are you going to pay or something like this? So um, 
you are changing the property, do it as, make, make sure you make those solutions as simple as possible. Yes. And those fees can definitely add up too, can't they? Yeah, they go up quite quickly. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it's uh, it's a necessary part of the industry to ensure that uh, the body corporate fees are up to date. Um, no one really enjoys the debt collection part of it, but it, it, it works. You know, owners have to take responsibility for their, for their property. Mm, well, the money's needed, isn't it, to run the building? Yeah, exactly. So if one owner's not paying, then other owners end up, you know, other owners have to make up that deficit. So it's not really fair. It's not really fair on any, any, any of the other owners who are paying on a regular basis. So, yeah, be careful, please, and, and keep, keep up to date with those levies. <laughs> our financial reports we're going into this time. Our body corporate here on the Gold Coast has a 25-year caretaker agreement. Other than the monthly payments on the income and expenditure report, no other information is shown on the balance sheet or notes. Can you tell us what are the legal requirement required entries to the annual financial reports or if any changes to terms or duties would be needed to add it to the financial records? Our own auditor has advised that the entries to the income and expenditure are all that is legally required. Well, there you go. You've had the answer from the auditor. Um, the entries, the entries are all that's legally required. So unfortunately, I, I know I, I know what this person's saying. That they, they don't really feel that there's enough financial reporting. It's a, li a large line item for the caretaker's expense. Uh, you know, it might be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, and that's all you see. And you're like, oh, hang on, we don't have someone recording every uh, every tiny little item that, that goes out. But then we have this one substantial payment. We, we've really got no idea what happens to that. Um, yeah, sorry, but that's that's the legal the legal requirements have been met within that. Uh, so that, that's that's really the end of the answer. I guess there's a wider question here around how people feel about the caretakers and the frustration that they have about those contracts. Um, I'm, I'm a body corporate manager. We're in a service industry. We're not allowed to have a 25 year contract. I can't think of any other. I can't think of any other circumstance in. In our lives, where we sign twenty-five year contracts or anything like that, so I'm not. It, it baffles me that this this situation with the caretakers is being allowed to continue. Um, there's no. I can't really see any benefit for the consumers in having these contracts personally, and, and really, I'm what I'm a consumer advocate as a body corporate manager that we represent consumers. That's what we do. So it's. I, I can feel the pain of the owners out there who. Are, have a lot of frustration with this. Um, I just, I can only say, I'm personally, I'm sort of disappointed that there's not wider action at the government level to try to resolve some of these situations. Okay. Um, well, make myself popular with all the caretakers, out there, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's not a, it's not a. Uh, from a consumer's perspective, it just doesn't make much sense. Mm. We do have lots of questions coming in um, across Queensland about saying no to extensions and the way that the caretaking agreement is set up and whether they're um, you know, doing the things that are that are listed on their agreement and what happens if they're not. And yeah, so so it is a, a big problem, obviously, in, across Queensland. Yeah, I mean, we, we mentioned at the beginning that I, you know, I used to work in New South Wales. It's a totally different situation there. Uh, most of the building managers are on a, a short contract, one, one to three years. And they have to work to keep their contract. They, they most of them do a good job. Uh, you know, I always had an excellent relationship with all the building managers that I worked with, and I thought they tried really hard. But they, they are motivated by the fact that if at the end of that contract period, um, they're not they're not meeting the standards, then the owners have the option of changing. Mm. Um, and oh. that, that, that seems reasonable. That, that's what that's how our whole society, our whole consumer society, is structured. So it's very strange to have this one. Uh, one particular anomaly there that uh, doesn't really adhere to that. And we're certainly not saying that there aren't good caretakers out there. There are plenty of great caretakers out there and they do form part of our audience and we're delighted to have you and it's great that you're keeping yourself informed. I just thought I'd pop that on the end there. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not, there's plenty of people who are doing a good job and who are trying pretty hard. Um, I've got no problems with that, but it's, it's, it's just the contract. Those people who are doing a good job and who are trying hard, they'd still be keeping their contracts and they'd still be getting the benefits from that anyway. Yes. It's more, it's more the ones who, when that's not happening. Mm. Definitely. 
Um, okay, and we've had a couple of questions come in on this matter that we're just about to discuss as well. I've seen as um, as we've been talking, and it's to do with renting common property for storage. Uh, mm -hmm. Can a body corporate charge an owner a fee or rent to use all or part of the body corporate common property storage cage? We have about 10 cages available and 78 units. If three owners share a cage, the maximum number of units that would have the benefit of the body corporate common property storage cage is 30 units and 48 units would miss out. Is it fair for the body corporate to rent out the space? Yeah, sounds like a great idea. Um, you know, you've got some body, you know, you've got common property. Uh, I don't know if the body corporate can make any use of it for its own storage purposes, but if not, then it's just kind of sitting there doing nothing much. Why not rent it out to owners? Uh, it, makes, it makes perfect sense. You might need to develop a system. How, how can you do it? You could have an auction, perhaps, or you could just make, you know, I've, I've worked in some buildings, they just put up signs. Does anyone want to rent this space? And some people have said yes, derives a small income for the body corporate, which makes which is valuable for all owners. And that uh, the owner who rents the space gets the extra utility from that. Very good idea. I'd encourage all sites to do it if possible. Um, yeah, and proceed on that basis. Uh, it's an interesting question that's in comparison to one we were discussing at the beginning, where we were looking at the visitors' parking spaces. And I suppose some people could say, well, could you rent out businesses' parking spaces or something like that? Uh, I think that would be more difficult because where business parking spaces you become part of the council requirements yeah. being a building. So I don't know, you know, it depends on the building and everything, you might get some issues there. But perhaps some buildings, you know, if they've got excess parking spots, they can look at renting them or leasing them as well. But you have to do that on a fair basis. Like an auction, blind auction or something like that. Mm. They do. So in this instance, it's because the, the property is common property, isn't it? It's actually not council being designated by council or it's not an exclusive lot or it's... Yeah, I think so. And I mean, especially with storage cages, there's less competition for them than there is for parking spaces. You know, the, uh, parking spaces can be sold for quite a high, quite a high value these days. Um, a, a storage cage, is, it might depend on the building, but there's probably less competition amongst the number of people who want that. And if there is competition, great, you can just put the rents up. Right. So I wouldn't really see much problem with it happening. Okay, we're going back to parking again. Um, so this one's to do with parking on common property. Uh, our small body corporate unit has, uh, sorry, our small body corporate building has six units, but only enough space for three to four cars. One solution is to allow parking on common property. However, all lot owners do not agree that this is a good idea. Is there a solution if you don't have enough car spaces for all unit holders? Can the body corporate lease out the car spaces to residents who want them? How do we establish the rental value and period of lease? Okay, so I mean, we, we, we sort of just, we sort of touched on some of the issues here. I think it's very difficult. When, when you move into a property, you know, you should know how many car parking spaces there are. When you, when you buy a property, you know if there's one or two car parking Spaces, or you know if they're zero, and you you kind of get what you get to some extent. You kind of get what you get to some extent. So if there's only four spaces, um, it doesn't really say how these spaces are operating. So it's a, it's a little bit weird, hard, hard to tell because you, usually a space would be allocated to an individual lot or it'd be allocated to visitors. And then if it's visitors, well, it's visitors parking only, and so it's not really for the for the for the occupants of the building. And if it's allocated to a lot, it's it's part of their property. So you can't really take it away from those individuals. Um, should you be allowed to have parking on common property? Well, it doesn't sound very like a very good idea to me. You know, what if there's an accident or something as a result of that? These aren't marked spaces. Um, you'd probably have to make it you could make an application to council to add add additional space as marks. You know, I, I've dealt with some buildings that have done that, but then that 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 space become a common property space and perhaps you could sell it or lease it on, on that basis. Um, so I think it's very difficult for people here who are looking at trying to add extra parking spaces. I just I understand, I understand there's more there's more cars and spaces, but to some extent you have to cut your cloth to fit to fit what you to fit your suit, you know, you have to you've got what you've got. 
We did have a question that came up that was very similar to this down in um, New South Wales in one of the Q&As we did down there and that was to do with a small building like this and the owners decided that they would go ahead and allow parking on common property but it wasn't ever really, it wasn't a formal agreement, it was just an agreement between the lot owners that were there at that point in time and then uh, somebody sold their lot and a new owner moved in and they weren't happy about the situation and it had never been formalised and so uh, once somebody else moved in and they weren't happy for that to happen it sort of all fell, fell in a, a heap. So that, um, that question centred around how if you do make those decisions, it's a good idea to formalise them and put them in place if everyone's in agreement with it. Absolutely, because mm -hmm. informal decisions, are, you know, they're really informal decisions. They're not meant to don't really carry any meaning. If one person is agreed with it, the whole thing collapses. Um, if, you know, mm -hmm. Make an application to council. If council let you have an additional space on your site, then by all means, by all means, create one. But I don't think it's really something the body for just, just uh, okay approval for renovation so this is a bit different we haven't had a renovation question come in yet so far so uh, currently I have an application with the body corporate committee to install hard flooring in place of carpet the bylaws state that hard flooring must be at least 62 decibels and include soundproofing underlay with a five millimeter thickness to be installed under any hard flooring. I've submitted the application for flooring with an acoustic report for the manufacturer of 52 decibels and five millimeters acoustic rubber underlay to be installed. So my application has clearly met the requirements of the bylaws. However, the committee seems to be delaying the decision to provide consent. We are nearly six weeks and the committee has since approved my other requests, um, which were on the same email request. The decision is holding up other works. I've made several inquiries to the body corporate manager as to what the delay is and have only been provided with generic responses in the likes of, we've forwarded this onto your committee. I just wanted to know what avenues or rights I have if I've not been provided a response in an appropriate time frame. Okay, so, I mean, I'll answer the, the, bit, the, last, the last question here is what, what's the avenues or rights of the applicant? Um, as an individual lot owner, you are entitled to make uh, an application to the committee. You're, you're entitled to submit up to six motions per year to the committee. And the committee has to consider those within six weeks or provide you with a reason why not a request for extension of some kind. So I think you should activate that part of the legislation, make a formal application, a proper motion, and then force the committee into uh, having uh, some kind of committee meeting or a BOC so that you can get a formal decision one way, one way or another. That, that's, that's an avenue that's open to all lot owners. Um, six weeks is quite a long time. It doesn't always fit with people's building schedule plans, but that's what it is. So, that, so you know, um, you have to live with that. So yeah. from the committee's perspective, these kind of applications, I, I, I know that people agonize over them um, because they're, it's not so much it's not so much the application, but they're, they're worried about the impact of, on, on the person below. And if, and if adding this type of flooring is going to have an impact on that individual. And people, there's a lot of uncertainty about that. You know, there's, if, you, if, you, if you search up the issue on the internet, you could hear uh, nightmare stories about it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that are seriously affected. Uh, and, you know, committees are individuals who generally have the best interests of the owners at heart. So sometimes when they are taking a long time to decide, it's because they're, they're trying to do the right thing, but they might not have a definite path, pathway towards doing that. Or they, might, they might have had problems in the building in the past where, where people have said, my application's fine, and then it's, it's, it's turned out that there have been problems after the fact. So I think we have to be kind of sympathetic to that kind of issue. Um, but in this case, you know, the lot owner has made an application and the committee should consider it and have a vote on it. And if they choose to vote no, then the lot owner has their rights to go through the application process and, and everything like that. Um, and if they vote yes, then the lot owner can proceed. Um, so this, what I might touch on with this issue is that there is some, there is a school of thought that uh, these kind of flooring renovations don't need to have approval um, because it's, it, it's where it's whether or whether or not they, they are considered the common property or whether they touch the common property or not. Uh, and really, I've, I've heard some arguments that say, well, if you've got the noise bylaw in place, which is where pretty much every building does, that bylaw is sufficient in and of itself as a regulation because the lot owners are not allowed to have a high level of noise transference from one lot to the other. 
That's a school of thought. I don't know if it really applies. I think it's worthwhile people making the application to try and show that they're doing it as, as much as they can do with due consideration of their neighbors. Okay, and just going back to submitting the motion, that's something that's just come in with the new regulations a um, little bit earlier this year, isn't it? That you can submit up to six um, requests or motions in a year. Uh, yeah, okay. And so if uh, maybe if you could talk about that just a little bit, and also if at the end of the six week period, if you haven't received a response, like what do you do at that point? Yeah, so I mean, in, in the past, you could submit ideas and questions and things like this, and they could go into the void and never, never be responded to. And obviously, that was a fairly unsatisfying situation. So legislation changes in March, which now permits owners to submit up to six motions per year to the committee's consideration. The committee's got uh, six weeks to make a determination, or they can ask for an extension beyond, beyond that six weeks. Uh, if, if it gets to the point where you've made a submission and after six weeks you haven't had anything back, it's considered that the motion is defeated and then you can proceed on that basis. So if you are unhappy with the outcome, uh, which you probably would be as an applicant, then you could go to the commissioner's office and, uh, and follow through on that basis. Um, I think this is a very good piece of legislation and we've been encouraging owners to use it more and more where possible because it's it, it, it creates a situation where a decision has to be made. So if you just, what, what, what might have happened in the past is people ask questions, can I do this, maybe is this okay, that okay, and it's got a, it gets a little bit vague, and then answers come back which are a little bit vague, and then it goes on for three or four weeks, and then a month, and then two months, and three months, and before you know it, a year's gone by, and no, no, nothing's really happened, and everyone's got a frustration with being done. Having a, motive, having a motion, having a meeting, a decision has to be, has to be recorded, one way or the other, for better or worse, uh, and then that gives people a very definite and clear avenue for how to proceed in the event that they're unhappy with the final decision. Uh, I think that's a good thing for the industry, and I would encourage all owners who, who want an issue discussed to, to take to take that pathway because you will you will get a definite answer. You might not get the answer you want, but you will <laughs> you will get a definite answer. So. Okay. Well, we're coming up to um, just about almost right on um, at the end of the session. So what we might do now is just leave the rest of the Q&As. Um, but if you have submitted a question and we ran out of time before we were able to address it, please resubmit the question on our Ask a Strata question page on the Look Up Strata site and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. We thank everyone who has put comments up and um, and contributed to the, to the discussion while we were going through. Uh, at the end of the sessions, we always like to ask our guests to share any news they might have or recent achievements or new endeavors, uh, something exciting that's happening in the industry. Uh, so do you have something that you'd like to share with us at this point, Will? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd like to sort of mention the good news that's coming out of New South Wales in the last week with regards to professional standards. Uh, there's, there's the SCA, I think, is bringing in the new professional standards for all body corporate managers. I think that's, that's great news. And I saw some news this morning that uh, uh, a, a, a sort of real estate commissioner or a real estate SAR is going to be appointed. And I, I think that's terrific news for the industry. You know, we, we need to professionalize uh, as as tower body corporate um, professionalism is really our watchword. That's what we're that's what we're aiming for. That's where we want to that's where we want the industry to head. So it's really good news for me personally to hear that uh, well it's New South Wales, not Queensland, but I think what what, what happens there will sort of follow in Queensland over time. That there is this kind, of, there is starting to be this wider push across the industry to have a uh, greater focus on professionalism. And for us as uh, Tower Body Corporate, we couldn't be happy to hear things like that because that's what we're trying to provide our owners with. Yeah, very good news. I agree, Will. Great news to hear that that's happening down in New South Wales. And yeah, hopefully they'll roll it out to Queensland and other states around Australia as well. I think it's necessary. Uh, okay, before we go, I'd like to say a really big thank you, Will, for joining us today. Um, I know it's a, it's a special day for you because uh, you're good news this morning with England winning. <laughs> yes, I was watching the football this morning. Apologies to anyone if I look a bit tired, uh, if my voice is a bit harsh. Of course, I was uh, spending a couple of hours shouting at the television uh, prior to this meeting, but that's how it goes. But I have a large <laughs> smile on my face at least for now. <laughs>
Okay, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Again, if, you're, if you've joined us for other sessions too, we hope to see you at sessions that we have in the future. We have them regularly, uh, either on a state base on a Thursday or we, we pick a topic that's national. So please keep an eye out for upcoming events in the, in the Look Up Strata publications that we put out. And don't forget to watch out for the July edition of the Queensland Magazine, which is due out at the end of next week. So thank you so much and we'll see you at a session in the future. Thank, thank you. you very much, everybody.